Oh, it's his happy face. We do have, he is coming to talk to the youth. It's sad when the wife needs a definition what his happy face looks like. He needs to encourage that. It was a strange thing happening right there. 7 a.m., men's breakfast, followed by leaders meeting, 8.30. Then we'll have normal Sunday service and city celebration. That's it. Over to the happy face. My golly, she's lovely. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, great to see you this morning. Welcome, welcome. And uh, really, it's good to be together. And for those online, great to have you along with us as well. And I do want to do a, a quick shout out to all of our incredible team who put on the GLS. You can see Global Leadership Summit still got some of those things here. They did an amazing job. We had about 160 folk from around uh, the city, different companies, different businesses. And I'd love to give a round of applause for our amazing production team, all of the guys, catering team. Thank you so much. And um, we want to change that leadership dynamic in the life of our city, that people would learn to see themselves as leaders. We need godly leaders rising up in our city, and uh, so well done to all of you for that. A couple of you as well might need, this might be your saving grace moment, because you, you know you haven't been on your outreach that's this year. And, and you know, every time we advertise another outreach, come on out, look, because we want you on at least one outreach every year. Inside you go, yeah, and then you don't. So this is your saving moment. There's a good friend of mine, Mtoko and Pumi. They lead a church in Zikaweni. They're planning a brand new church into Impangeni today. Access Church is launching at 11 a.m. today at the rugby club in Impangeni. So uh, if you haven't yet been on your outreach, you're welcome to come and join myself, Chad. A bunch of us will be there. And uh, that's 11 o'clock today in Impangeni. We can go and support them at their launch service. And now, Father, thank you so much for this opportunity this morning as we gather around your word to, to love you by loving your word, to open our hearts to you by opening our hearts to your word. We say, come Holy Spirit, come and let your word penetrate. Let your word go deep inside of us to cut us deeply if need be. We want our hearts to, to be pierced so that devotion, loving devotion for you would flow. And so we trust you, Holy Spirit. I pray for your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. Well, we're continuing our journey. If you are new to uh, Outlook Church, there it is, called to, there we go, kids ministry. This is something that I don't know if I've ever preached about, spoken about before, but as I've been pondering it, thinking about how relevant is it to different people in the life of the church, I've realized it's actually relevant to all of us. I want to talk today about something that uh, God has spoken over us as a, as a church. God has given us prophetic word. And I'm praying as part of our vision script that our hearts would be moved this morning. But let me start here. In uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 36, this is a story about Jesus. He's just been born. Eight days later, they bring him up to the temple. And it says in Luke 2, 36, there was a prophet or prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Peniel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Anybody here very old? No. No, 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 no. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. You know what I love about this story? God in his loving wisdom, kindness, omnipotent power and presence gave Jesus a praying granny. That's what happened here. God gave Jesus. Baby Jesus, I have assigned you a praying granny. Now, we don't know how much longer Anna lived from that moment, but one thing I know, if she lived in the temple, never left the temple, always praying day and night, and she had just met, and she prophesied, she knew this is the Messiah, Jesus had a praying granny for the rest of her life. And I want to tell you that praying grannies, and I've said it many times before, are one of the most powerful force on planet earth. How many praying grannies do we have here? I love praying grannies. We need more. And I'm going to recruit you today. If you're not yet a praying granny, I am going to recruit you. I'll tell you why. Because I was incredible. 
One of the wisest, cleverest things I ever did in my life was to get born again in Howick. That's right, I gave my life to Jesus. I was 17 years old and I lived in Howick. Howick is the granny capital of the world. World. I'm telling you, they've got more grannies per square kilometer than any other part of the world. So when I was born again into this church in Howick, I don't know, a whole lot of these grannies, I think like, oh, I want a grandson like him, whatever. And then they just adopted me and prayed for me. So I don't know why, but they did. So right through, I think some of them, I hope they're still alive. Bless them, Lord, because I need their prayers. They were praying for me. Big idea is this. All of us have a part to play in raising this next generation that Chaz has been speaking about. And I want to take a little bit of time this morning just to, uh, to highlight a few areas, part of our vision, and how you fit into that vision collectively, how do we as a church respond? So here's another story about Jesus a little bit later, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. He's now 12 years old, and after three days, they found him. Yo, can you imagine? Joseph and Mary, every year they go up to the temple to Jerusalem and they worship and all the family, the friends, the cousins, the extended family, they go up together in a big caravan and, and they worship the Lord and then they head back. A, a whole day goes by as they travel back towards Nazareth. And, and moms, you know what it's like when you kind of like, I know Jesus is here. I'm, I think I saw him this morning. He's probably with his cousins. And then lunchtime, he doesn't come, but he knows that. I mean, he's got that aunt and she always makes the best that. And so he's probably there. And so now it's getting towards evening and it's like, Joseph, why don't you call Jesus? I said, I thought Jesus was with you. I haven't seen Jesus. And then you start speaking to the cousins and the extended family. And at some point, moms, your heart is beginning to like, well, cook, where is this boy? And then you begin to realize and nobody has seen Jesus the whole day. You thought they were there. They thought you were here. And now the most awkward prayer ever prayed in the history of mankind. It's from Mary. God, I've lost your son. I mean, can you imagine that prayer? I mean, if ever you wanted to get out of a prayer, that was the prayer. And so then they, they turn around, Mary and Joseph, the rest carry on. They go back to Jerusalem, day two, day three now. Now they got to start hunting. And now it says, after three days, moms, how do you feel? Three days you've been missing and looking for your 12-year-old son. They find him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why are you searching for me? He asked. Don't you know I had to be in my father's house? I want you to think about what that moment must have felt like. Your father and I have been anxiously searching for me. Why are you searching for me? Don't you know I need to be in my father's house? Can you see that in that moment, there was a, something, a dynamic that had shifted up to that age of 12. I mean, Joseph wasn't his biological father, but he was his adopted legal father. And he treated him as a son and he would have had a father-son relationship. And up to that age, Joseph was probably his primary dad. But at that moment, something shifted. At age of 12, in the heart of young Jesus, he made it abundantly clear, my heavenly father is my primary father. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And then he went down to Nazareth with him and was obedient to him. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus was ready for this transition into becoming a young adult. And what I love so much about this is it highlights it's the only gospel that brings in this little story about Jesus. And obviously his parents, his mom and dad had trained him. They brought him up. The schooling system was around the Torah, learning about Moses and the law. And I can only imagine for Jesus what it must have been like as he, as he read uh, the, the writings of Moses and he began to see the prophetic words and the Psalms and he began to see himself more and more in all of the Old Testament. And by the age of 12, Jesus was ready to enter this thing called adulthood. And I want to talk today about our responsibility as a church in preparing our young people for this thing called adulthood and what it means. We have a responsibility to prepare our children for adulthood, to prepare them and point them towards their heavenly father. Now, as a church, we've had amazing prophecies over the last 23 years about what God wants to do amongst our kids. And we pulled it together into our vision script, which says we, Outlook Church, are called 
to find new ways for kids to advance the kingdom. God's called us not to entertain kids on a Sunday. God's called us to find new ways for kids to advance the kingdom of God. Bringing parents to the Lord. Yep. One of the things God has spoken prophetically over us many times is that actually as much as parents should be bringing their kids to the Lord, many times it's going to be kids who bring their parents to the Lord. Going out in ministry teams and ushering in revival. God has got huge Huge plans for our kids and kids' ministry. The challenge for us is to be innovative, to be prophetic in the way we disciple and lead our kids. Many prophecies have pointed towards revival coming through the kids. And many times we've had prophetic words that our kids would be going out. Not just a couple of us going to different outreaches and nations, but our kids spearheading mission trips to other churches into other regions. And so... Briefly this morning, there's four things I want to talk about. I want to talk about why kids' ministry is so important. But then I want to focus on what's our role collectively in kids' ministry. But then I really want to drill down, thirdly, what's your role? Moms, dads, grannies, grandpas, what is your role in discipling our kids? And then fourthly, finally, what's the dream that we have and how do we get behind it? So let me jump in quickly. Why is kids' ministry so important? Two big ideas. grab hold of is simply this. I want by a show of hands to ask how many of you committed your life to Jesus before the age of 18? Okay, there's a whole number. In fact, apparently the average age of salvation right around the world is about 14 and a half. One statistic I read, it says, in fact, in the years prior to age 12, they're the prime years for reaching a person for making a commitment to Christ. Nearly half of all Americans who accept Jesus as their savior do so before reaching the age of 13. Now here's the reality. This is the sweet spot. This is the age, if if we haven't reached kids, this becomes harder and harder to reach people later on. Kids ministry is critical for reaching kids. But here's the second reason. Well-known Proverbs 22 verse six, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Parents, how many times have you clung to that verse? How many times have we lost your word? We're trusting as we lay a foundation. The earlier kids are taught, the deeper it goes into their thinking. The earlier kids are taught, the stronger they hold because the stronger their faith will be. Now here's the flip side. The world is teaching your kids and shaping their identity from a very young age. I wanna talk to you parents and some and grandparents in particular. I want you to realize that the, that the world is not nearly as silent as the church is about some critical issues in life. The world speaks loudly. I don't think we've spoken about sex many times as a church. I remember, I think this year or the end of last year, part of our marriage series, we did one, which I thought was a very tame, gentle, beautiful session Quentin and Nikki did. I was grieved when a couple of people complained to us as elders, how could we speak about this when there's teenagers in the room? And I wanted to say, dear parents, Do you realize that your kids are being taught about sex every single day of their lives by the world and the internet and you complaining to us as pastors who spoke about it once? You should be complaining to us that we don't speak about it more often so our kids will hear it from here and not just from school. Amen? The world is not silent. The average age that your kids are gonna be exposed to pornography is now down to like nine to 11 age group. It's not a question of if they ever get exposed. No, when. It's gonna happen. So we can be those Christian parents who are like, no phones, no internet, no nothing. I want my kids never to be exposed. You're dreaming in love and kindness. They're gonna be exposed. The question is, have we prepared them? Have we laid a solid foundation in their lives so that they know how to handle these things when it comes their way? The average age of experimenting with alcohol and drugs is rapidly coming down. The confusion around gender issues is something. If you my age and older, you would be clueless as to what goes on in schools nowadays. 
just recently on our trip to Spain, it was brought home to me in such a, a powerful way when I spoke to this one particular family who, who, whose daughter was going through this. The peer pressure now is not to be normal. It's, it's, the peer pressure is to try another gender and try another form of sexuality. And you as loving conservative Christian moms and dads who believe in the Bible, as soon as you start saying something, if your kid repeats what you say about what God says, that's when the teachers get involved. And now there's lawsuits and prosecution because you're just trying to stand up for what the Bible says. That's what our kids are facing. Kids ministry is critical. We can't just hope and trust. Yes, we do hope and trust, but we've got to minister to our kids and we make disciples, not just of adults. We've got to make disciples of our kids. Now more than ever, we need to help lay solid foundations in the lives of our kids. It's the average age of maturity is coming down. Those things that you were exposed to when you were 16, 17, 18, now the kids are being exposed when they're 11, 12, and 13. We've got to prepare them and prepare them well. The internet has sped up the age of learning. And so kids need, we need to teach our kids solid theology, not baby them. It was one of the things that Chad, who who leads the youth, we were discussing this at staff meeting. And he said, don't think young kids can't handle deep theology. They can. They can handle it better than we would imagine. There's a pandemic of immaturity in the church and we've got to reject that, break through it and trust that our kids can grasp the deep truths of God's word. Kids ministry is critical now more than ever. What about this? What's our collective and especially our Sunday responsibility in terms of kids ministry? In Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 16, it said, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. And it's so easy in kids' ministry to realize this is the main event for the adults. The kids are the distraction around the outside. And into the midst of this, people were trying to bring kids, but they make a noise and they're disruptive. And Jesus rebuked the disciples. And he says to them, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then he makes an amazing statement. He says, truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children into his arms. He placed his hands on them and he blessed them. He has the amazing thing. The kingdom of God is so radically different, opposite to the kingdom of the world. Our worldly thinking is we adults need to teach the kids. You know what Jesus said? You adults need to learn from the kids. In the kingdom of God, we need more kids teaching adults because they can teach you what it means to trust. They can teach you what it means to just believe what God says. And Jesus flipped that thing around and he says, no, we've got to watch our thinking. We've got to change our thinking. We should be learning more from the kids than always expecting the kids just to learn from us. Not all kids who come to kids ministry have believing parents. We have kids coming to our kids ministry who don't come from Christian families And it is a great opportunity to introduce them to Jesus, to his word and to worship. We've got some kids coming into our kids ministry who come from a very boring experience of church. And most people that you meet, so many people you meet, they get put off at a young age. When I was young, I was in church and it was boring. And that's the only thing I remember. Church equals boring. And so they don't want to go back to church because that's the mindset they've adopted. We have the opportunity to break that to teach them that serving Jesus is fun, exciting, and it's the greatest adventure of our lives. We get to support parents in the discipleship role. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Our role here on a Sunday is to support you, moms and dads, in your discipleship role. It's not to take the discipleship role from you, but to support you in your discipleship role. We get to be key influencers. I was reading, we were talking about in our staff meeting, about someone was saying how research shows that as you grow up, there are gonna be five key influences, people in your life. Like hopefully it's mom and dad, but it might be a school teacher. It might be a best friend. In other words, there's five people who are gonna have the biggest influence on your life. Kids ministry leaders get to be one of them. And our prayer, that's our prayer, that someone from kids ministry will be one of those big influences in the life of our kids. We get to be a consistent voice in a changing world. We get to never give up on wayward kids. And let me tell you, some of your kids have been wayward. 
I've had to go into kids' ministry literally to break up fights amongst the kids. It was our kids, I agree. But that's beside the point. It's beside the point. Sometimes our kids are not always angels. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. We get to take, we get to take a parenting role in so many kids' lives who don't have a mom and a dad coming from broken families, dysfunctional families, absent families. We get to create opportunities for parents and kids to connect. Someone uh, said like this, we heard some feedback. I don't enjoy church because it feels like the adult's playground. We've got to change that. We've got in our values and what we spend money and what we focus on, make sure we're focusing on the kids more and more. Many of you will know that famous Zulu proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. That's so true for the life of the church. In fact, um, Adam, uh, our youngest, was sharing some of his stories. Now, he's grown up. I mean, they've only ever known Outlook Church. They were born after the church was planted, so they've grown up in the church. And one of the great privileges we've had as parents, I mean, he calls Quinton Papa Q. And what I love about that is sometimes it's easier for our kids to speak to someone else's parents than their own parents. Sometimes there's questions, concerns. And I'm delighted that my boys and, and girl have had access to other godly men and women to be able to ask questions, receive input and guidance from. It really does take a community to raise our kids. Question is, would younger kids come to you? Are you open, loving, accommodating, getting down to their level, interacting with the kids so that if they do have a burning question or need some help, they know they could come and talk to you and they'd find someone loving and listening. Very quickly, let me move on to uh, third. What's our parents' and grandparents' responsibility? In Matthew chapter 18, verses six and seven, it says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Hectic. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. When I read that scripture, it puts the fear of God inside of me. And the reason it does is because I realize as parents, we have the greatest influence on the morality of our children. Not necessarily on their social aspect. Normally their peers and friends at school will influence them more socially. But morally, mom and dad still has the greatest influence. In other words, the choices, the moral decisions your kids make and my kids make will primarily be determined by our influence. Influence for good or influence for bad. And when I read this, but woe to them through who it comes that makes them stumble. Dear God, parents, grandparents, our kids are watching. Our kids are looking and learning from you and I. We were doing a bit of a, a brainstorming. I had uh, around our staff meeting, we had uh, Shantae who heads up the kids ministry team and we had uh, Chad who heads up the youth and, and a whole lot of people who had such experience amongst kids ministry and we're just talking through some practicalities. And here were some of the responses from the team. What's our great responsibility? Take your marriage more seriously. And this is from Chad and he's not married. <laughs> he said, here's the thing. The teenagers, their biggest drama and hang up in life is relationships and probably because they're looking at their parents' marriage. Take your marriage more seriously. It's modeling and showing our kids what relationships should look like. Take marriage seriously. Daily devotions with little kids are some of the most tender moments and special bondings with God and with parents. If your kids are still young, oh, don't miss this beautiful, sweet spot of being able to do devotions with them, reading those Bible stories. I remember with my boys, and that was one of the most favorite times of the day. There was a tenderness to that moment. When the Bible's out and you're telling the stories and you pray, then they ask the real questions, the deep theological questions when you're clueless. Even if you're the pastor, you're still clueless how to answer some of those. But that's when the deep things come out. Don't miss those moments. Dining room table discussions, please. For the love of God, sit as a family around a dining room table a few times a week. Thank you for that, amen. Please don't fall into the trap of having all your meals just in front of the TV while you watch different things. 
Remember, we've been on and on about this. Dining room tables are the sacred space. That's where Jesus was doing most of his discipleship. Don't let the enemy rob you of those moments when you can talk and ask questions and interact. Have at least a few of your meals a week around the dining room table. Please, parents, grandparents, ask your kids what they learned in kids' ministry. Please do that today. As you drive home, if you've got kids right now in kids' ministry, make a point. Let it trigger your memory. Every time you drive through the church gate on your way out, let it trigger your thought. Hey, kids, tell me in detail, what did you learn at kids' ministry? Get them to talk, to share. It reinforces what God might be saying to them. Moms and dads, I love you. Stop making your kids lead you to church and you start leading them to church. The number of times I speak to families, you know, the only reason we came that Sunday is because little Johnny said, come on, mom and dad, it's Sunday, we're going to church. Oh, okay, <laughs> not funny, bad leadership. Okay, moms and dads, we are called to lead our kids and not have the kids lead us. Model a passion for Jesus. Not a passion for church, although that's helpful, but a passion for Jesus. That's what your kids catch. They catch what you're really passionate about. You can say you're passionate about Jesus, but you only ever talk about fishing. Guess what's really number one passion in your life? That passion for Jesus. If you want your kids to catch, they're gonna catch your primary passions in life. Do you have a passion for Jesus? I remember hearing one story, one of them was telling us about a dad who always did his devotions every morning on his knees praying, and then little Johnny was soon kneeling next to his dad, couldn't even read, but had his Bible out pretending to read just because he wants to do what dad does. I remember Adam, I mean, he's 20 now, but he started shaving at, I think, four or five. Because he wanted shaving cream as well on his face. And then he'd use the, the back of the tooth, toothpaste tube, you know, that flat side. And he would shave every morning, just wants to do what mom and dad does. No, mom doesn't shave. Yeah. Permission to treat the congregation as hostile. Moms and dads, make your home the home that the kids come to. Rather, let them come and abuse your house and eat all of your food and make a mess in your house than always your kids go to someone else's house where they're probably making a mess of your kids. Moms and dads, lovingly discipline your children. Lovingly discipline them. The Bible's clear. It says no discipline equals no love. That's what it says. It means you've illegitimate children. The sign of good fathering is when you... Discipline your kids and train them lovingly and then model Jesus living, apologizing, taking responsibility, servant leadership. Sure, we could go on. I'm gonna land it there. Just one last thing. Remember, the kids today, what they're facing are so different to when you and I grew up. Come on, go and play outside. Why don't you play outside on the streets all the time? You don't want your kids playing outside on the streets. The world they're living in now, don't keep comparing your childhood to theirs. It's very different. Here's one of the big revelation moments for me. When Jesus was absent for three days, Jesus didn't go looking for mom and dad. Mom and dad had to go looking for Jesus. If you're waiting for your kids to come and find you, stop. You go and find them. You go and find what they're passionate about. Find what they're interested in. Find where their heart is and go and meet them there. Don't wait for your kids to come find you. You gotta go and find them. And lastly, as we come into land, Matthew 3, verse 16 and 17, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him and a voice from heaven, the voice of the Father said, this is my son whom I love and with him I'm well pleased. Only twice in the New Testament do we hear the audible voice of the Father and both times the Father says the same thing. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. And so here's some big ideas regarding our dream, that we would create a safe place for kids to be able to talk and find help. That we would see the power tools of gifting inside our young people released. There's no mini Holy Spirit. They get the same Holy Spirit we get, and we wanna see big gifts released in little kids. 
We want to teach our kids to shine their light from a young age, teaching them boldness and courage so that they're not swayed by peer pressure, but sway others by their convictions. We want to get kids active from a young age in ministry and serving. Let me ask quickly, serving teams. If you're a serving team leader, how many kids have you got in your serving team? See, a few hands, good. Don't you love you driving here sometimes and you see Arthur with your hunt directing traffic? <laughs> and then I know Arthur works hard because once he's finished parking duty, he's part of the chess team as well, collecting the cushions after the second service. We want to see our kids learning to serve Jesus passionately from a young age. We need more men in kids' ministry. Ladies, you are amazing. We love you and you are incredible. Men, it's time to rise up. We need more men, godly men, who can come and teach kids ministry and do the stories and connect because so many of them don't have dads and we need you to step in and fill the gap. And we need more and more opportunities to take our kids and go. Take your kids with when you go on mission trips. Time to land. In our connect group, we've got uh, three youngsters, Bo, Zonda, Dorian. And what I love so much is we always do our connect group having a meal together and then we just stay around the table and we talk about the Bible and we break bread and we pray. And what I've loved, I mean, their ages are like about eight or something and nine and 12. Or, I, sorry if I get their ages wrong. But what's been beautiful is to hear the incredible insights from them as they take their turn to read the verse and then they take their turn to share what they feel God is saying, you know, from a particular verse and then hearing them pray afterwards. And I think to myself, if you keep growing up around a dining room table, meditating on the word of God with adults who then interact and discuss and ask questions. Oh Lord, that's gonna shape so much of their lives. So let's keep our focus on the importance of kids ministry. Let's take up the mantle of prayer for our kids. You praying grannies and grandpas. Some of you are called to step in and begin to teach our kids. Please step up. And parents and grandparents, remember, we are called to make disciples. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? And while you do, they've got a little 30-second clip just to remind you, because I'm going to lead us in a prayer now. Why don't you give us a glimpse? What goes on in those uh, ministry classrooms while we're singing here? And while that's playing or about to play, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for the gift of our children. Father God, we thank you for every young life that you've entrusted to us as Outlook Church. Father God, we thank you for the prophetic words spoken over us as a community. Father God, we don't wanna see kids ministry as a glorified babysitting or entertainment to free up the adults. Father, this is a primary ministry to make disciples. Father, I thank you for our incredible team, Lord, for Shante and for all the volunteers, all of those who are involved. Thank you, Lord, from those who register them to those who do singing and to those who prepare the crafts, to those who teach. Thank you. Father God, I pray that that team would continue to grow and be enlarged. Father, I pray today for moms, for dads, for grandparents. Father God, I pray that we would rise up in this calling. Even for those who maybe don't have biological children here, you'd burden our heart. You, Father, are the adopting Father. That we would carry the hearts of fathers and mothers to love and care for our children. Father, would you come and adjust our mindsets this morning? We wanna make disciples and kids are a huge, huge part of it. Come Holy Spirit. Just take a moment. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants to emphasize something for you this morning. And while I do, if you're here this morning and you've never made the conscious, intentional decision to give your life over to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And Jesus walked along the beach and he called Peter and he called John and he said, come follow me. And it said immediately at once they left everything. And from that moment, they became followers of Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling something of that call. You don't understand it, but there's something inside your heart saying today, something I've got to give my all for this Jesus. If that's you, why don't you put up your hand quickly? Just where you are, I'm not gonna call you to the front now, but it's good for you to make a faith response. Is there anyone like that this morning? Just don't wanna miss that opportunity. If you're wrestling over that, we're gonna be praying for some folk now. We're gonna pray. If you need healing in any way, please come and join us for prayer. And if that's you and there's a wrestle inside, come for prayer. We'd love to pray with you, introducing you to Christ and getting you started on that discipleship journey. Father, thank you.
for your incredible love and your goodness. Thank you that as we go, we go knowing your gracious hand is upon us in Jesus' name. And God's people saying, May the Lord bless you. Thursday, fasting day, prayer meetings at 5.45. Hope to see you there. Tides and offering boxes at the door. If you want to make use of that, God bless. Let's have some tea and coffee together. Amen.